The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to our introduction to Reliability Principles webinar. My name is Simon Carlos, one of Wild Analysis Business Development Managers. We're focusing on reliability training, consultancy and software. I am extremely pleased to introduce Bob Petch, one of our reliability specialists, who are presenting the webinar today, addressing key concepts behind reliability engineering, highlighting key definitions used and an overview of software tools to support the reliability engineering process. The webinar will run for about 25 minutes, at the end of which we will have a Q&A session. I want to make you aware that all attendees are currently on mute, so if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them directly onto the questions dialog box during the course of the webinar, and we will aim to address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Before I hand over to Bob, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to summarise the Wild Analysis portfolio. Wild Analysis has been in business since 1980, and we're a leading provider of engineering analysis uh, services. And for the benefit of those who haven't spoken to us before, uh, we are specialising in technology transfer through consultancy, training and software. We're the sole distributor of the ReliSoft suite of software, which Bob will refer to during the webinar. In addition, we also have a portfolio of other software products catered to specific industries or physics groups. And I'd encourage you to visit our website, wildanalysis.co.uk, and get in touch with us if you're interested in our other software suites. Now over to Bob. Okay, thanks Simon. Hi, my name is Bob Patch, and uh, in this webinar I'll be giving uh, an overview on the key stages of a reliability program and some of the tools available to help us achieve the, uh, the desired reliability goals. I'll give a precise definition for what we mean uh, exactly by reliability, availability, maintainability and safety, known as RAMS, as it is important to be clear uh, to be clear and make a distinction on how different mechanisms contribute towards performance, uh, overall to help us achieve dependable designs. As there are so many tools and techniques available, it can be difficult to know what to do and when, uh, and I'll, I'll go through a typical design for reliability process and highlight where tools will be most useful. Um, Finally, I'll go through a few of ReliSoft's uh, specific tools, some of the most popular ones, uh, and just highlight how they can be used to assess reliability. So these will include XFMEA, BlockSim, Weibull Plus Plus, and Lambda Predict. Um, so to start then, what do we mean exactly by uh, dependable designs? Dependability means that our design or system will achieve our objectives and requirements in terms of reliability, availability, maintainability, and safety. The emphasis varies significantly from application to application. Uh, some designs need to be very safe, others very reliable, uh, whereas some need to be very um, highly available or very uh, easily maintainable. Some of them will require all of those things. Uh, this may cost a great deal of time and effort, and dependable designs don't just happen. Firstly, we need to know what we mean by RAMs and how we can measure it. Widely used tools allow us to model our understanding of the system, its modes of failure, and the interactions between them. Tools allow us to examine a design critically and objectively, identify areas of weakness, run a series of what-if scenarios of possible solutions and changes, and really understand the limits of our knowledge and quantify any uncertainty that we've got in our analysis. We may need to prove that we've met our targets, uh, and this can be done through a mixture of uh, quantitative and qualitative methods. So one of the most important steps in quantifying reliability is to give a clear definition of what we mean by failure. We define a failure as the termination of the ability of an item to perform a required function. It is an event that requires a time and a place. A fault, on the other hand, although undesirable, does not prevent a desired function from being performed, although it will require unscheduled maintenance to correct. <clears throat> It's not always obvious which category an issue falls into, and this is why it's best to be as specific as possible. So, for example, if we consider a dented car wing, could that be seen as a failure or a fault? Well, uh, although it's mainly cosmetic in this example, uh, what if the damage was significant enough to actually foul upon the wheel? In the case of a snap pencil, does it still function as a writing age? However, would it be suitable for small children? And the stop sign here probably doesn't need too much explanation. Um, but really, when, it's, when deciding whether we're looking at a failure or a fault, it will depend on the function. And so that also should be very clearly defined. Is the ability of the function terminated is really what we're trying to decide. So 
The four classic parameters of system assurance. Um, reliability is often used generically to cover the whole field of dependability, although in itself it has a very specific meaning. Um, so by, by uh, dependability, really, we're looking at all four areas of reliability, um, which is the key part here is based on stated conditions over a stated period of time. It's uh, measured as a probability. That is, we give it as a uh, value between naught and one, where naught means it's completely unreliable and one being perfectly reliable. Availability, and uh, this often comes back to uh, something being available on demand. So when we need to use it, will it be there? And it's a combination of both reliability and maintainability. Maintainability can have a number of definitions. Uh, the one given on the slide is um, consistent with the reliability and availability de definitions and is actually taken from IEC 60050. And this too is expressed as a probability. Um, safety is more, more difficult to define, uh, mostly because there's no actual mathematical definition of safety. This is because there's no absolute definition of risk, only social perception. Uh, this creates great difficulty for the safety practitioner because perception changes through time with media exposure and culture. In general, though, we're trying to make things safe for people. And so social perception counts for a great deal since making our system safe may cost a considerable amount of money. Uh, so although similar, it's worth mentioning that there are some subtle differences between quality and reliability, uh, mostly in the way that they differ in the point in time at which they apply. So whereas quality controls assures that a product or process will work um, after assembly and as it's designed, reliability looks at how uh, long the product or process will work as it's intended. So to cover off what exactly reliability engineering is. Um, as, a, as a field, it has the aim of achieving better products through objective assessments. Um, as a result of an effective program, we should be looking to achieve the point shown on the screen, where the goal is to understand previous and current performance so that we can better plan for future performance and any issues that we may encounter and therefore rectify them where possible. So why do we do reliability engineering? Um, although developing more reliable products will generally increase development and manufacturing costs, the payback is a reduction in the long-term costs that arise due to failures within warranty periods or, or anything that requires a product recall. Um, the m big knock-on effect of this is that it carries uh, forward onto a company's reputation, uh, particularly relevant with ever-increasing expectations from consumers who are more informed than they ever have been. Uh, this in time will lead to a company becoming more competitive and ultimately profitable. What we're trying to do here is manage risk. Um, how can we reduce risk to an acceptable level while still meeting time and, and cost constraints? So really, it's, it's an objective view uh, with the aim really of becoming more efficient and, and cutting costs uh, to become more profitable. So how do we actually quantify failures? Um, every product uh, will have many different ways in which it can fail to serve its purpose. Uh, we, we call these failure modes. Each failure mode can have different characteristics, and what is of particular interest is how these failures surface over time. A familiar concept to most is the bathtub curve, which considers how the number of failures seen changes over time. Um, firstly, a decreasing failure rate represents an issue that occurs less as time progresses. Uh, this is typical of early life issues that arise from things such as weak design, assembly errors, damaged components, poor joints and connections, dirt and contamination. Uh, next, a constant failure rate is typical of random failures. Failures are an indication of operating stresses, poor maintenance, operator abuse, accidents. Um, quite common as well with electronic components is that they have a, a, a seemingly random failure rate, but also consistent. Um, finally, an increasing failure rate is a sign of wear out, uh, where damage is accumulating, um, and this is where maintenance uh, scheduling can be very effective. These failures will occur typically due to um, you know, wear, insulation breakdown, fatigue, corrosion, erosion, and that sort of thing, uh, particularly prominent with, with mechanical systems. Uh, overlaying these three modes gives us, us the recognizable bathtub shape. Um, although the scale of each region uh, very rarely matches uh, the one shown, the overall trend and the, the general shape of it is, is consistent. So there are many different tools related to reliability engineering. Um, some of them are qualitative, um, some of them are quantitative, and some are a combination of both. 
A selection of these is shown on screen. Um, I suspect that many will be familiar and are usually performed in most engineering businesses to at least some extent, uh, as much of it is simply good engineering practice. Overall, we are trying to, uh, trying to form, formalize these and combine them in, uh, combine these individual activities into a process that consistently uh, evaluates performance and continually tracks improvements rather than a, just being a tick box exercise. Determining the level of detail and best time to use each tool will vary depending on the application, resources and time constraints. For example, if a project has a short deadline but a considerable budget, more time may be divested, uh, invested into a design of experiments and accelerated life tests, whereas for projects with limited resources but flexibility with time, uh, direct life data analysis may, uh, based on field performance, could be preferable. So this, this chart presents uh, an overview of the stages and the company activities of a typical reliability program uh, that can be implemented during a product development cycle. Uh, along the top are the key phases in a product's lifestyle, for, uh, sorry, life cycle, from initial concepts through to support. Um, for those interested in later stages, such as decommissioning, uh, many of the same tools apply, although they're in a slightly different order. The top row highlights the overall stages which must start with a clear definition of objectives to uh, keep the program focused. This will then lead on to risk assessments using tools such as FMEA and fault trees, which will then be uh, discussed in the upcoming slides. Um, an initial reliability assessment can then be performed to determine whether the program will be feasible by looking at the previous performance of similar systems. Then, once the design moves on to more advanced stages of specific uh, development, uh, tests can be performed to gain confidence into the life that can be expected from the system. Then, with the design finalised, it is important to ensure that the manufacturing and assembly process does not detriment on performance. Reliability can be maximised using burn-in processes and uh, implementing process controls. Throughout the entire life of a product, it's important that findings are fed back upstream so that problems can be rectified and future uh, reliability can be improved as time progresses. Uh, to help accomplish these activities, there are a number of specific tools within the ReliSoft Synthesis Suite. Uh, each tool is specific to each activity. For example, FMEAs are handled with XFMEA, Life Data Analysis with Weibull++, Accelerated Life Tests with Alta, and so on. These analyses are stored in a common database across the Synthesis Suite, allowing data to be shared across a project, which allows our re results to feed into subsequent stages and any updates to be carried through accordingly. So just to put those into perspective of how they're used throughout a reliability program, um, this chart shows how the, uh, the tools can be applied, uh, again, through from concept right through to support. Uh, XFMEA, for example, can be used from the very early stages. Uh, you'll see this highlighted with the, with the blue F. Um, so when you're even just uh, planning your design for reliability plan, uh, looking up existing data and knowledge and performing change point analyses in your design and process FMEAs, uh, XFMEA is constantly referred back to. Um, BlockSim can then be used as a tool for looking at system level studies, uh, including risk and safety, reliability ad, uh, allocation, maintenance planning, and then also fault trees and reliability block diagrams. Weibull Plus Plus and Lambda Predict are then used at various points when we're trying to predict reliability parameters for individual components and subsystems. So based on the uh, empirical evidence on times to failure, we can develop reliability models, which then feeds into our other analyses. Um, I'll just quickly give a brief explanation of these four tools uh, and what we hope to achieve with each one. Uh, so the first one I'd like to look at is uh, the failure modes and effects analysis. Uh, it's usually called an FMEA, uh, and it's a qualitative technique that is all about understanding and managing risk. Uh, there are many different types of FMEAs, including FMEKAs, which includes a more detailed risk ranking techniques. Um, but the most important thing to remember is that it's the method that counts and, and what we're trying to achieve with it. Um, where potential failure modes are identified in a, an FMEA, uh, and this is best achieved by those that understand the product. Uh, these failure modes are then ranked based on how likely and se severe their occurrence will be. Based on that information, actions can be raised to deal with the most critical issues, with less time wasted on issues that are of less concern. The FMEA should be treated as a live document, which should be reviewed and updated as the design develops. The purpose of the FMEA is to improve a product or process through obje objective and critical assessment. 
We want to identify the vital few issues from the trivial and many in order to use our resources most wisely. There are a number of benefits in using a specific software package to record FMEAs. By using a relational database, existing knowledge can be stored and recalled to either review a previous analysis or to use a previous one as the basis for a similar but new product. This helps both save time and ensure thorough and consistent studies across a business, uh, which is especially important when different team members are involved in, in various analyses. Any actions that are raised as a result can also be allocated to those people responsible uh, and tracked right through to completion. Uh, most importantly, though, it facilitates in making the document live so that it can be kept up to date and referenced when needed during the development process. So following on from the qualitative assessment performed in the FMEA, it's desirable to then get a quantitative figure on the expected reliability of a system. The reliability of the system can be dependent based, uh, will be dependent based on the reliability of its underlying subsystems and components and how these are connected together. There are two primary methods to model this, uh, reliability block diagrams known as RBDs and fault trees. Um, <clears throat> Although these are very similar and often interchangeable, they do differ slightly in the perspective that they view reliability from. So reliability block diagrams uh, consider the success domain, uh, where the overall probability of the system completing its mission is based on the likelihood that all parts of the system work as required, whereas fault trees consider the, the uh, failure domain. Uh, so we're looking at the probability of things failing with a, with a fault tree. Uh, and so based on a series of undesirable events that we can express as a frequency of occurrence, how likely is the top level of the system to fail? RBDs are most commonly used for reliability calculations. However, fault trees can be preferable uh, when it's easier to define what constitutes a failure rather than what we mean by a success. In order to construct a system level model, uh, though we need to understand the probability of failure for each component and subsystem uh, at various points in time. The frequency that failures occur will fall under a distribution uh, with respect to time uh, that can be descri described with a statistical model. This can be determined based on knowing the times to failure for a number of samples of a particular component, uh, component such as a light bulb, or switch, a light bulb or a switch. Uh, with, when the model is known, it's then possible to extrapolate and predict future performance. Uh, the frequency of failures will change over time, depending on which region of the bathtub curves under consideration. So it's really important to, to get a good, good feel for how that bathtub curve relates to actual performance. Um, there are many different places that we can get data uh, to perform a life data analysis. Uh, lab tests give us the most control. Um, but will have significant time and monetary costs associated with them. Uh, warranty data is very powerful uh, as it reflects actual use condition. Um, it's mostly just a, uh, a large exercise processing the data itself, but it can be very powerful uh, also when looking at the performance of previous but similar products on the development of a new product. Where possible, uh, the manufacturer sh uh, should be consulted as they may actually have performed their own life assessment on components and have results available to share. So the manufacturer themselves may have some specific information uh, that's going to be relevant for an analysis. So here is a typical reliability plot uh, from a life data analysis where a mathematical model, in this case a two parameter Weibull distribution, has been fitted to a number of known times to failure represented by the red dots. Uh, for a Weibull plot, we plot these on a log, log, log scale uh, with the best fit line shown in black, providing the model parameters. Uh, these parameters can be seen at the bottom. Uh, the gradient, beta, uh, being less than one, indicates that failures are becoming less frequent with time. Uh, and the scale parameter, eta, of 2,900 uh, hours gives uh, the point in time at which 63.2% of the population will be expected to have failed. And then this data can be fed directly into BlockSim as a component and then compiled to give the system level view of reliability. Um, in the absence of specific life data, however, um, it is possible to refer to a number of prediction standards that have been developed for generic components from both military and commercial field data. Uh, this data has been gathered empirically over a good number of years for both electronic and non-electronic systems. 
uh, although it does usually work best for electronic components such as transistors, capacitors, resistors, relays, and so on. Uh, Standards-based prediction can be used effectively in the early stages of the design process when specifics on component choice and layout is not available uh, to give an indication of the plausibility of a project. Um, High-risk components and subsystems can be identified with a change in component choice being noted early on. Um, and then off the back of this, it can then also be used to complete those system level uh, RBDs or fault trees uh, to give us that system level view on reliability. So uh, that concludes today's webinar. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll now pass you back over to Simon. Thanks, Bob. Just before we go to the Q&A session, I'd just like to make you aware of our upcoming webinars and training courses. Uh, we have a life data analysis webinar on the 28th of July and a system reliability modelling webinar on the 4th of August. Both events are held at 2 o'clock local UK time. And the uh, upcoming training courses that we have, we have three uh, coming up in the near future. Uh, these are uh, Introduction to Reliability Principles uh, on the 20th of August, Foundation of Effective FMEAs, which is a five-day course from the 7th to the 11th of September, and Managing and Improving Reliability within Electronic Product Design, which is a two-day course held on the 17th of September. Uh, for more information on these courses, please visit our website at the website's address shown on the page. We look forward to seeing you at these events. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them into the question box, and we will try and get through as many as we can in the time we have available. I've got a couple of questions here already, so um, Bob, these are for you. Uh, first one I've got here is uh, how does accelerated life testing differ from life data analysis? Okay, um, so they're, they're very, very similar. Um, the only difference is normally with a life data analysis, you'll be testing the components at use conditions. Uh, so that will be actually at the stress levels that you'd expect them to see in the field. So uh, the time to failure is therefore representative of what you'll see in the field. Whereas an accelerated life test, in particular a quantitative accelerated life test, um, increases stress levels uh, to accelerate the times to failure. And really what we need to understand there is the rate at which a particular stress level has uh, decreased the time to failure. So does it, by doubling the temperature, have we halved the time before we start to see a failure? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next question I have here is, how much data do you need to perform a life data analysis? Oh, okay. Um, this is this is a tricky one to answer, really, um, and it will all depend on the quality of the data that's coming through. Uh, in, in general, though, it's better to have a few trusted data points. Uh, an analysis can be performed with as few as um, five to ten failures. Um, but like I say, in general, it's, it is all about the quality because ten trusted data points are will provide more insight than one thousand points of noise. So, yeah, it does very much depend on where, where the data is coming from. OK. Um, another question I have here for you. Uh, how many participants are required for an effective FMEA? So FMEAs as well are often um, a little bit um, misused in the sense that they can, they can be very big team efforts when they don't need to be. Uh, so a lot of FMEAs are performed on an individual basis uh, very effectively. And the most important thing is that somebody knowledgeable about the um, knowledgeable about the product itself uh, is able to hypothesize what failures will be expected from it. So uh, individually these can be performed um, but really going up to teams of six to eight people as a maximum uh, really mean that you get the most out of it when you are then combining those individual FMEAs. Okay thank you. Okay yeah. I've got one final one here. What's the difference between mean time to failure and mean time between failures? Oh okay so uh, mean time to failure um, is generally, they're, they're more or less interchangeable. They are used interchangeably. The, the subtle difference is just in the definition of the system that's under interest. So a mean time to failure is for non-repairable systems. So a, when a system fails, it will then be switched out, at which point it will then be a new system or a new component that is under interest. Whereas a mean time between failures is for a repairable system where the influence of the repair itself will also be accounted for um, within, that, within that figure. So that also has an element of, of maintainability in there as well. Okay, well, I think that's uh, all the questions we have. 
So um, on behalf of uh, Wild Analysis, I'd like to thank you for attending uh, our webinar. Uh, we can provide a recording of the webinar to, you, to those who want it, so please uh, uh, send a request in to us and we'll respond accordingly. And we look forward to uh, seeing you again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot.